Presidential candidate of the Social Democratic Party, Prince Adeoli Adebayo, has said Nigeria's Afrocentric foreign policy has not brought reciprocal benefits to the country. Speaking at an event tagged NIIA platform for 2023 presidential candidates, Prince Adeoli said the theoretical pathway to a, benefit, a beneficial foreign policy is the realist power focus school of thought and action he further explained that economic diplomacy is the way forward if nigeria would use foreign policy to advance its own domestic priorities in spheres of fighting poverty and ending insecurity well joining us live today is prince adewoli adibayo he is the presidential candidate of the social democratic party sdp it's good to have you join us good evening it's a pleasure great um a couple of us um watch um, some clips from the NIA um, um, conversation. Of course, um, many people would look at that as the, our own Chatham House, um, for those who do not go to Chatham House. But let's start by talking about, you know, the re relationship with our foreign policy and fighting poverty. Explain that to us. Well, you see, the, every country on the international stage, it's like a housewife we see in the market. If you see a housewife going to a milk store in the market, it means that she lacks milk at home and she needs milk. Mm -hmm. So the other woman might go to a tomato store because she wants, you need, she needs tomato. The other one goes to where they sell bed sheets. So it will be foolish for a housewife that, that needs bed sheet to go to a tomato store be pricing tomatoes. So you go outside internationally to express your domestic priorities. And in our foreign policy uh, today, we've not always been doing that. Mm. And under an SDP government, if you look at our manifesto, we're trying to direct our leaders and to direct the country to where you go on the international stage to face your problems at home, to try to take advantage of relationships internationally, of uh, business internationally, of trade, of investment, so that uh, the foreign minister is an extension of the government in trying to bring goodies uh, mm. back home. And that is why we didn't go to the Chatham House. Even though we were the first to be contacted, we realized that we must let Nigerians first understand what foreign policy is all about. And our engagement with the international community should be based on the fact that in this country, what we face now is crippling poverty and debilitating insecurity. And if I'm going to be president of Nigeria, and I'm the chief diplomat of Nigeria, any country that I engage in in the world, I must ask myself, how is this engagement capable of helping me to reduce a poverty in my country to the point of eliminating poverty? How does it conduce to an arrangement whereby I can keep Nigeria secure by having full control of our territorial integrity, and by having peace, law and order in the country and safety, and ensuring that this country is a country where the citizens feel at home and they feel secure and now our international partners have to do the same thing for their own country. It is to balance both that will determine which organizations will join, which international organizations will become very active, and which priorities we pursue. And when we are sending people overseas uh, to our various high commissions, to our various embassies, we are not sending people overseas because they wanted to be senator at home and they lost election, or they wanted to be governor in their state and they lost election. It will be that if I want nuclear energy technology from, from France, then I'm going to send a well-respected French-speaking nuclear scientist to go to that country and represent How many them. of those do we have here? We have so many of them. Nigeria is a country that has a field. In fact, one of the greatest uh, nuclear scientists that has worked uh, for licensing and operating that all over the world uh, has been a Nigerian. So Nigerians are very good. In fact, what we don't realize is that... But do it, they work, are they resident here? Because you say they can be Nigerians, of course, but then half the time they get snatched up by, by other countries. Who anywhere you find Nigerians, they belong to Nigeria. When Awolo became really? finance minister, he met MS Umaru, who was working for Shell. Just, Awolo just went to have a meeting with Shell, and I met a Nigerian, a very young man, very brilliant, from Kano State, and said, how can you be this brilliant? And you're on the other side of the table. And he insisted that he must come and work for the Nigerian government. So you can do that. You can co opt your citizens. People don't realize that when uh, South Africa changed from apartheid government to become um, a democratic government, and there was a policy to go to South Africa 
to remove the biological weapons from South Africa. Nigeria's Maurice Ewu was one of those that led the delegation from Washington to go and uh, the program uh, nuclear, um, biological weapons in, um, in um, South Africa. But what did Nigeria make of him? They made him an INEC chairman. <laughs> they did not make him a, a biological weapon expert. So these are the priorities that we need to set, and we can do that uh, successfully. And talking about relationships, I mean, um, the US and the UK have had very healthy um, bilateral relationships with us. Um, we've had, um, I think, maybe the longest relationship with the UK, the US. Um, and when you say that prioritizing the, the countries that you have relationships with and, you know, based on their own, also their own foreign policies, of course, don't you think that the UK and the US may be top the list? Well, from the point of view of the British, I think they are happy with their relationship with us. Because if you look at 1960, uh, first, we are a British, we were a British colony. Mm -hmm. In some way, we are still tied to them in a particular way. And if you look at our relationship with Britain and... Uh, if you look at right, right from colonial time and now, and if you look at from 1960, Britain has been getting better as a country. British uh, businesses have been doing very well here. And in the balance of trade, it's always been on the side of the British. In the balance of payments, it's always on the side of the British. It's not because the British are not nice people. It's because they have a better government. They have better leadership. So once we have a better leadership here, we will still continue our relationship with Britain, but we will have common sense which is very abundant in London, and the shortage of it in Abuja. That's why you don't find British politicians coming to NIA in Victoria Island to come and talk about their problem. But you find our people go to Shatham House, uh, taking British Airways plane, and uh, filling the plane with our own money, and then going there to pay for airtime. Uh, air so we, what our government will do, is not, we're not against Britain, is that we will do our own part. It's, it's like a game of friendly game of wrestling. You have to hold your ground. So it's just that. It's like playing tennis or playing uh, ping pong with your opponent. The bat is in your hand. It's your hand. So if he plays to you and you don't know how to play back, you can't blame him for that. Hmm. You will lose the match. But if you play with him and he plays with you, the game will become more interesting and you become friends. So what is happening is that domestically, our leaders are disconnected with the purpose of government. They don't understand why Nigeria is a republic. They don't understand the priorities of a citizen, they don't realize the minimum guarantees of our constitution that we give to our citizens that if you are born in Nigeria, there are certain indignities that should not happen to you mm -hmm. just because you are born in Nigeria. You should be free from hunger, you should be free from simple diseases, you should be free from joblessness, you should be free from insecurity, you should be free from homelessness, you should be free from potholes, bad things that can easily cut your life short. So these are the guarantees and the resources are here in Nigeria. So when you go overseas, you are looking for partners who will come and do business with you in a wholesome way that you can still have control over your resources. You can, they can make money out of it. And you will see that um, whether you talk about the British, the Americans, in dealing with us, they are also dealing with other former colonies. They are dealing with India, they are dealing with Singapore, they are dealing with Canada, with the US, it used to be a colony of the, of the UK. And those countries are doing well. They are dealing with Egypt, they are dealing with so many other countries that used to be under them. What is the difference? The difference is that in those countries, they've learned how to be friends of the British, friends of the Americans, with some integrity at home. So it's just like your friend comes to your house to visit you. You're not likely to say your wife should quit the bedroom and go and stay in the, in the gate house. Uh, your mother should stop coming to the living room because you are hosting your friend. But if you do so, your friend is not going to control your house for you. You will just go away that this person uh, lacks home training and has no common sense. So next time he's coming, he will bring his dog. And his dog is going to go to, straight to the kitchen while your wife is cooking and eat all the food. Because he knows you are not protecting your home. But if you protect your home, you manage, he will sit with you in the parlor. He will respect the limit you give to him. And even for your security guard, he will respect him. Hmm. That you have respect for your security guard. And if security guard says, sir, can I open your boot and check? He will allow him to do so. Because he knows that you are protecting your home. So you need... To do well internationally, you need a government that respects you. So Nigerians cannot say, when we go overseas, they don't respect our passport. They beat us up. But they're beating you up at home as well. Mm. They don't respect even your birth certificate in your country. They don't respect anything about you. So I, I don't know any Nigerian who will say he's been to England and a British policeman has slapped his face. But you are very much likely to be slapped in Nigeria here. So that's why my foreign policy 
will reflect first our domestic priorities. So no foreign uh, agents, no foreign government can maltreat Nigerians because they will already know mm. from the briefing they get from the embassy that Nigerians value their citizens very well and that Nigerians value their money very well. But if your president is coming like comatose in their hospital and they can see his medulla of Langata and his intestine in their hospital, how are they going to now respect you when you now dress up and start talking? So they know you have like seven days to live or ten years to die. So they all have all that confidential information which they will have had to send their secret service to find out about you. Now they know everything. Mm. They know everything about you. How are they going to respect you if most of your oil money is kept in their country and you are hiding it from them, from your citizens? So they won't respect you. So that is what I will try to explain to Let's let's, let's talk about place. yes because you see you're saying whatever we must um, whatever picture we want to paint to the international uh, on the international scene we have to start from where we are. Why do you think I believe that um, in this country, like you said, we have some very intelligent people, technocrats, professionals, and and we're hoping that these same sets of people would make it to you know leadership. Why do you think that we've continued to go around in these circles of um, bad governance or having the wrong, wrong people in the wrong office? What do you think is responsible for that? There are three reasons for that. One is that being intelligent, being, out, being speaking well and all of that, does not automatically mean that you have leadership qualities. So many will blow all the grammar on TV, but the first opportunity to see about a uh, $10,000, they, they will lose their sense. So that's number one. So you need to have character along with it. Secondly, the people who are in charge of Nigeria are not visionary leaders. They are people who believe in state capture. That is to say, if they grab the power, then they will keep, if, they, if you have talent, they'll keep you at the back of the bus because they don't want to lose grip. They don't want they don't want the country to make so much progress that they're no longer in charge. But why do, so, you, why do you want to run a country? I mean, you tell me you want this country to progress, and then you get into power, then you put the people who would help you progress in that office, uh, you know, in the back burner. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, but that is a challenge, because every country that makes, that, that makes progress in the democracy, their rulership comes from the people. And you don't have any person being in power for a long time. And here in Nigeria from 1966, the same clique are in power. They can only drop out of power if they die or something uh, that serious happens to them. So they want to keep the system going. That's the second reason. The third reason is that Nigerians like entertainment. So even when they see qualified people, they are rather following those who are entertaining them because there is a, there's an innate conservatism that is in Nigeria. They want progress, but they don't want change. So they just want uh, a, a better version of the same thing. So if, if they have who's, a... Who's this day you mean? Because, I mean, I, I'm guessing that today's Nigeria. Please. And all the things, I mean, we all have been bitten by that bug of no money, um, no fuel, no light. Why would that same person fall in the category of this day that you're making reference no, to? People can complain about the problem of today, the symptom. But... The solution they will not is that like somebody who is being who is having malaria, but he lives in a, in a nice house that is full of mosquitoes. So he's not going to leave the house because he loves the house, but his mosquito is still killing him. So he's going to say, okay, I want better supply of uh, Panadol, better supply of uh, analgesic, better supply of uh, malaria medicine. But if you say to be free from this malaria, you have to quit that house. He's not going to do so. So it requires political education. It's not because Nigerians are laid back. It's because countries that make change, the change has to come from inside your head first. You have to say, I'm, 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 turn, I'm done with this. I want to accept this. So that has to happen. Second is that you have to also have ability to discern from re-change from when you are being fooled. So when this, because if you say you want, if you are being oppressed and you say you want a change, the oppressor will be changing his color, changing his, but he's not changing the system. Mm. So you have to know the difference between when you are changing personality, changing color, changing slogan. So there are still Nigerians who believe that if you are in APC and you move to PDP, okay, the man has changed. So, which is nonsensical, but a lot of people believe that. If you are in PDP and you change to labor, they will say, oh, the man has changed. So, it is, so you need a level of consciousness on a mass scale and the social... And the, 
both social media and traditional media have a role to play in making sure that they are entertaining people, it's fine, but they're educating them more. So if you look at the political discourse, uh, now, if what I'm discussing with you is boring to some people because it's based on policy, based on ideas, but if I say that uh, so 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 person is a drug dealer, so so person is a thief, so person is a thief, then it will trend more because they think that politics are about entertainment and vulgarity. So it is for us now to say, look, there are consequences to an election. Uh, you can, the person you elect as president can determine whether you, are, you live or die. Mm -hmm. If it's a good commander in chief or it's not a good one. It, 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 whether you are able to access simple basic amenities of life, whether you, your children can finish school on time, whether you can have a disease that you go for surgery and it's over, or it can, that disease can actually kill you, mm -hmm. it depends on which kind of person you elect as government, in government. So if people realize this, and they also realize that there's no magic in a democracy, there's no, I don't know any democratic system that has been built on prayers. The, the democratic system is built on decision making. And that the most important decision is that one that the voter makes. Every other decision made in government is based on the original decision that the voter makes to say, I'm going to elect this person to make all those decisions. So if we can correlate all of this and we have an open space and we're actually consciously looking for talents. So that if anybody comes up, he's talking fast, he's talking nice, you can start to interrogate him, check his background, check his ability to, to answer cogent questions, uh, test him in many multi-dimensional ways to know that this person is consistent, this person is coherent, this person is, is actually competent. And then you start to test the person in terms of character. So all those things are what make those countries that you see on TV and you want to go to. It is the kind of quality of decisions that their voters make that makes the country to be like that. But if you want to make poor decisions, you want to be inattentive, you want to, to be entertained, or you want to vote according to your prejudice, then you are going to get the same government that reflects those values in the judgment. Let's talk about the realities that are on ground. I mean, just as you said, there's a lot of mudslinging now. This is, uh, you said, I said, uh, and now the most recent is who stands behind or who throws his weight behind the Naira, the new Naira notes uh, situation or who is against it. There seems to be a lot of people filing behind the CBN governor and then a few other people who are, you know, on the opposing end saying that this one way or the other is a sabotage of, you know, uh, the elections. But what do you think about the CBN policy on the new narrow notes and, of course, the fact that tomorrow supposedly is the deadline, but uh, there's been a Supreme Court um, um, injunction on a, a staying of, I think they said, um, yes, the stay of action for everyone concerned until, um, I think, February 25? First and foremost, there are three layers to it. Before it became this theatre of absurd, where it's now related to election, the original error was that the central bank governor, I've been saying it over time, doesn't work for the central bank. He works for a few people in the state house. And he has abandoned his ability... I'm sorry, what? He has abandoned his ability to govern his... It's called a governor. Yes. He's supposed to govern the bank. But he has been an errand boy, a dutiful errand boy to certain private priorities in the state house, in Azovila. And who are these people? I don't know because they keep changing every day. That place. And how and how do you know that? I don't know because of his priorities. Number one, there are two components to finance, to public finance: the fiscal side, that is the revenue that the government receives, and the expenditure that the government makes. They are contained in the budget. Usually, all over the world, governments run into trouble all the time because sometimes they don't collect enough, and they have bogus priorities, and they want to go and pursue those. The job of the central bank, if the general bank governor knows basic economics and knows his duty, is to make sure that governments come and governments go. I will not allow government of the day, elected by the people, whether they are competent or not, I will not allow them to destroy the economy. So if they are taking a measure that is dangerous to the fiscal and monetary health of the country, the central bank is meant to take countermeasures. So if a government is overborrowing, they will make the cost of borrowing to be higher so that they can discipline the government. They will, com they will uh, comply and enforce the laws relating to creating of credit and creating of debt. Mm -hmm. So the central bank has abandoned all, all of that. So everything that is the priority of the government in place is what they do. 
And it is not because the central bank governor is a lover of President Buhari. No. Even when President Jonathan was there, he did the same thing for them. It is just the wrong person to be in the central bank. So he appears to be a total uh, opposite of what the governor of central bank So you're be. telling me if that you compare so, to, for so example, you're against this CBN policy from the, from the get-go? It is not a policy. And it's even media are supposed to be sanctioned. It's, not, it's an exercise. Because if it's a policy, where is the policy document? Because there's a way you do policy in government. You will come out with a blueprint. You will take it around to those who are interested. Then it will become a white paper. Mm -hmm. So you will not know that, okay, every five years, we change our currency. This is how much, we, how much time it takes. These are the stakeholders. No. What happens is that as this government is going, they are all wild now and desperate to award all sorts of contracts. So they managed to award this uh, putting crayon on the money and change the color. That's what they achieved. Now, in doing so, the central bank has a history of having changed our money in 1967. They changed our money when we had the civil war mm -hmm. from old pound to new pound. In 1973, the central bank changed us from the pound to the naira. In 1984, they changed us from changing of color, and that was terribly done. People were committing suicide because then head of state, Major General Buhari, gave Nigerians 12 days to change our currency. He gave reasons. Our money has been thrown abroad. Our money has been hidden in people's houses. It was a highly unintelligent exercise. So people were committing suicide. Soldiers were beating people all over Nigeria. Families got ruined because people had a lot of cash. At that time, there was no POS. There was no transfer. So some people will take their money to the bank and they will not get it back. They were even doing deals with bank managers. Okay, just give me half of my money. So bank managers became very rich and soldiers were flogging everybody. And if you were a military man, you carry your money to the bank, they will march you inside, you can change your own within five minutes at one point. But if you are a civilian, you will suffer. So now, was it that Gwari was trying to help us with the election at that time? The man, with due respect, whom we elected as president, whom we are responsible for, is totally unfit. So now, at that time, we survived that. But under Abbas Sanjo and Shah Soludo, we changed money many times. We just don't know. We introduced new notes. We changed from paper to polymer. When the polymer was not doing well, we changed back to paper. It was seamless. And I can tell you this. In my private life, before I became a candidate, I spent many years as a lawyer to currency producers in many parts of the world. So I've been involved in currency design, currency exercise, and all of that. It's never done this way. And I won't surprise that even the traditional bad advisor to Nigeria, IMF, even they are alarmed that anybody can shock their economy this much. So, mm. from that point of view, that even the minister in charge of finance was not aware, Nansima, not aware, and Manufacturing Association, not aware, all those people who use money, nobody was aware. They are in a hurry to award the contract to themselves and run away. Now, they now run into a problem. Because of the lack of professionalism and the poor timeline that they use, what happens to them was that they absorb a lot of currency in, but they didn't have enough printed. So they now went into rationing. So because of that rationing, they now said, if you go to a counter, they should not give it to you. They should give it to you through a bottleneck called ATM machine. Ordinarily, this ATM machine suffer calibration problem. The cassette jams sometimes. Sometimes they don't have power. So they now constricted it to make to manage that shortage because they didn't so you're saying that what the cbn governor has been saying about the fact that oh we've sent money to the banks it's the banks that are not releasing these monies is a, a you are, tale you are just, of sorts no the central bank governor is in panic naturally it's not a good manager a piece of decision so he's lying he's confused so as a result of that the bankers committee why has he not called their meeting mm -hmm. so what is happening is that when i started doing my investigation i started finding out where is this money I found out that I, I did one direct study in Benin City, one ge first generation bank. I don't want to give them free advert here. In a very big rich zonal branch, they were sent 100,000 naira in new notes. And the bank manager said, even her own staff was already saying, Madam, before you carry this 100,000 into the cassette, let us, we, your workers, let us go and line up first so that we can withdraw 5,000 naira each so that we can have transport money to go home. So that's inside the bank. So 
they're just lying because they are the regulators of these bankers, so they are not going to come out and say our regulator is lying. So now, in order to now explain to a compopulated and confused president why this commotion is there, they now say, well, we are trying our best to stop people from taking the money to bribe voters. Now, if you look at the original reason given by the central bank, he gave three reasons. When he said they didn't mention voters' money, he said one, that there was too much money outside the banking vault. So they wanted to mop it up. Yes. Two, that the money, some of them had loved their integrity. They were already overused, some had expired, so they didn't. Three, that the money was being used to pay ransom, to do other criminality, so they needed to control that. Now, if you had studied basic economics, you will know that the policy objectives cannot be achieved by changing color. One, if you want money to stay in the banking sector, two things you have to do. Within your territory, you have to make it more profitable to keep your money in the bank. In those days, when I was growing up, my grandmother used to, my great grandmother used to keep her money under the pillow. And my grandmother used to argue with her that if you put this money in the bank, you earn some interest on it. Why are you putting your money under your pillow? So now if you keep your money inside your pocket, it is safer there than inside the bank because if you put your money inside the bank and you go to the bank two minutes later to withdraw it, you will pay COT. If you should transfer to buy Gary, you will pay COT. So because of that, your money is losing value. You are paying high cost of transaction. So people will not go to put their money in the bank. So that policy of changing the color does not change it. Second, if the money has expired, you, what you can do is to take that money inside the bank and not reissue it. Yeah. But when their policy or so-called lack of policy started operating, the bank started recycling the money. You give the money to them, you go to the ATM, you get the same money. Thirdly, criminals, the only way to stop criminal, criminals from collecting money is not to change the color of the money. Because if the Naira is green and you change it to blue, the, the kidnapper will collect blue, do, blue Naira. Lastly, if he has studied basic economics, if he went to school of economics for one hour, you will realize that our money circulates according to value. Value creation in economics in Nigeria is that the um, underbank sector, the informal sector, has more value. So money will go to the where there is value. There is more gari sold in the market and the bushes than in the supermarket. There is more food given by Mama Put than inside the hotel. So there is more transportation done by Kabu Kabu than is done by transport companies. So it is where the value and services are being rendered, that's where money will go. So you can change the color of the money a million times. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is to formalize your economy. So this last one they are doing is just an excuse to say, we are trying to save you from people who are buying votes. Let's but politicians decided to take position on it because of the fact that we have an unthinking political class. Oh, it's going to hurt my opponent. There must be a good policy. That is what you are saying now. Before we go, let's talk a little bit about the politics within your political party because we are almost out of time. Um, recently, the, um, the chairman of the state, uh, the SDP in your state, moved on to the People's Democratic Party, which some, according to them, some other members of the ex group. 16 of them, according to them. They're about. Um, let's let's take, have your take on this uh, because um, a lot of people would say that... Um, one way or the other, this has discombobulated your party. Has it affected, you know, because this is almost a few days to elections and for members of your executive to move to another political party, that does not say anything good about how the party loyalty or where the loyalty of your people lie. No, it's that it's the only thing it has done is that it has cost PDP money. Basically that. Because what do you mean by that? Because they spend a lot of their money buying high time and celebrating it. But it's just, the person who left our party... So you're is, saying the, rele the person who left your party has no relevance whatsoever? The person who left our party has, rele has relevance. But if you listen to her speech, why she left the party, she said the SDP is a very good party, and she learned a lot in the SDP, but she's of the view that the party she's going to, because she's from Lagos State, the party she's going to uh, has more energy uh, for governorship election, and they ask her, who are you still going to vote for at the national level? Say, I'm still going to vote for the SDP at national level because I think they have the best platform. So, and she's a very good person. When she was in the party, she rendered very good services to the party. And she took that decision. And they asked her, did you go with 7,000 members of the party? She said, no, just 16 of us left the party. Every hour in SDP in Lagos State, we have over 200 people joining the party. So if 16 left, that's not a calamity. But I can assure you that People have left the Labour Party 
a whole city state come to join our party. We don't have money to advertise uh, academic achievements. We are more interested in making sure that we send our message to the people. So it's a thing of pride for me that a state chairman of our party who left our party can cost uh, PDP millions of naira on live airtime to celebrate. But in the end, I don't think it's going to make much of a difference. But the key issue we want Nigeria to understand is that the SDP is not to play the politics of gold. What we are trying to let you know, there's nothing fanciful there, okay. is that this country has extreme poverty, 1.3 million people in poverty. We cannot afford to hyphen 30 people in poverty. So we must deal with it, given how much resources we have. Secondly, the most states in Nigeria are insecure, 36 of them, and FCT. People are kidnapping people in the FCT. They even threatened to kidnap Buhari and he ran into a, a, a cellar to hide himself, I was told. So you cannot afford to have one missing child in Nigeria. So you need to have a serious-minded government that is focused on eradicating poverty and keeping the country secure. And okay. anywhere you call us to come and talk about those things, we will come. But if you want to do entertainment, wait until after the election because we don't think the election is for entertainment. Okay. The election is for setting the country all right. I will want to have you back again maybe next time for a whole hour because there's a lot more to talk about. But Prince Adeoli Adebayo is the presidential candidate of the Social Democratic Party, SDP. Thank you so much for speaking with us. It's a pleasure. All right. And God bless Nigeria. We'll take a quick break. When we return, we'll be talking about the uh, Supreme Court's position on the new Naira note and, of course, what the AGF is saying about it. Stay with us.